a muscular cell is elongated, it also has to fit into the human body and you can see that the human body is not at all uniform. So we cannot have uniform skeletal system, neither can we have uniform musculature system. So the muscles have to accommodate themselves at a tiny place, at a broad place, as slender or ribbon like and that is how we can categorize the muscle, the muscle type or the different types of muscles seen in the human body. Now we can see that the muscle cells are arranged in broad sheets. Obviously, these are going to cover the torso of the human body. So the broad sheets of mus muscle cells will completely cover the entire broad part, the torso which is almost rectangular in the front and behind and that is how the broad sheets of muscles are formed. Second types you can see as the, uh, they are ring like structures. Now, where do these ring like structures fit in the human body? Well, there are many sphincters. The sphincters are almost behaving like gates. Now, as you eat the food, the food enters and part by part it is allowed to enter the stomach. So, there are two different sphincters walking there as an entry gate and exit gate. Such places need ring like muscular structure. So, here I can give the example of pyloric or cardiac sphincter. So, that pyloric sphincter is the one which is at the exit gate of the stomach, right? Now, the next category that you can see is that of ribbon-like. Now, this ribbon-like structures are arranged at the length of the body. Now, which are the length of the body? The arms, the legs, both the places you need muscle cells which are running from one end to another, slender ribbon-like. So, this kind of muscle arrangement you will see in the structure wherever there, are, there is elongation of the body part. Now, again, we need to understand one more thing about the muscular structure. When I was referring to the sarcoplasm and the sarcomeres, I, we also need to understand the initiator of the entire process. The force that is being created, it is actually a biochemical work or a chemical frac factory where different types of ions are working hand in hand to excite the muscles and give them rest. Now, those uh, the, uh, the storehouse of those chemicals are found in the, uh, the endoplasmic reticulum of the muscle cells and we need to understand that endoplasmic reticulum is a common term. So, we have to specify them or allot the endoplasmic reticulum just for the muscle cells and again typically we incorporate the word sarcoplasmic instead of endoplasmic we write as sarcoplasmic reticulum. Now, the apart from providing the proteins or the ribosomes required for protein synthesis that every endoplasmic reticulum does. Sarcoplasmic reticulum is asked to or provided with plenty of calcium ions. Now, this calcium ions are stored in the sarcoplasmic reticulum which will trigger off the process of the movement, alright. We will come back to it later when we are actually doing the biochemical part of the musculature. Right now, we need to understand a typical structure of one unit of the muscular system. And what is that one unit of muscular system called? It is the sarcomere. So, when you are asked what is the structural and functional unit of a, a muscular system, you need to answer it is sarcomere that is the structural and functional unit of the muscular system. Now, this sarcomere has got a very distinct appearance as I had discussed earlier, you had seen in the first diagram where we had introduced the skeletal muscles or the striated muscles, the sarcomere is 
typically depicting one unit of a striated muscle the typical sarcomere it has got alternating dark bands and light bands now when we say dark bands and light bands now there have been uh, the german scientists working behind this and they have actually given names as per the german language to make it easier for the children the words were tremendously big and difficult to pronounce so we have brought them down to alphabets you can see whenever you look at the diagram of a sarcomere you will find alphabets you will find a you will find z you will find i what are these these are just the names or the alphabets depicting what these scientists have actually seen under the microscope and they have given their names now the sarcomere you can see that it is a unit one unit the light light band there is one light band and there is a dark band now the light band will have very thin structures of or thin filaments of musculature thin muscle filaments and the dark band will have the thick muscle filaments so when the movement is happening actually there is a sliding over of the light band over the dark band and that can be seen that on either side you will find the light bands and in the center you will find a dark band and as the movement happens they are actually sliding over each other making the movement successful now what is the light band called as the light band is called as isotropic band or the i band and the dark band is called as the n isotropic band or the a band this is easier nothing difficult well what is difficult is between the a band or the n isotropic band there is a particular structure which is more thicker now why that thickness happens is because both the ends of the thin filaments as seen in the i band they keep moving in moving out moving in moving out so when they move in they give a further center to the a band and that center of a band is called the hansen's line and this due credit given to the scientist who first had observed it and it is called the h zone so this h zone happens when the ends of this thin filaments move inside the a band now again there is one more center provided to the h zone and that is described as the m line now this m line if you try to find out the origin of the word we might take days to even pronounce it it is a very typical german word and hence for the benefit of everybody we just remember it as m line moving on to the i band now i band as i mentioned they are very thin filaments there uh, it's it's absolutely the ends of the filaments are incorporated in one sarcomere so you will have on one side of a sarcomere i band and on the other side again an i band and sandwiched in between will be the a band so this is your typical sarcomere unit i i and sandwich in between is a correct now coming back to the i band we can see that the i bands also have one center now if you look at it carefully that center is called as the z band or here the name of the scientist is the uh, it's the z band and called as crosses membrane crosses membrane because again he was the one who had first seen it so coming back to one sarcomere as i mentioned it is in the center of i band so from one z band to another z band becomes your perfect sarcomere and as you can see the filaments move over each other they actually form bridges 
and these bridges are the ones which are bringing about the different kind of movements. When we study about the uh, movements in uh, the skeletal muscles or the muscles which are attached to the skeleton, the striated muscles which are there in our control, remember the voluntary muscles, you will be amused to see there are two opposite actions happening. With every movement, there will be two actions happening. So, they are also described as antagonistic muscles. Why antagonistic? Because the action because the action that happens here is in absolute opposite direction. So, when I say I am moving my hand, actually I am flexing and I am extending. So, this movement is brought about by two different actions happening and so there is a successful movement. Now, I will list down here few of the antagonistic muscles that we can see. There are extensors and opposite there are flexors, correct? This kind of antagonistic movement is seen in both the limbs, the hind limbs as well as the forelimbs. Then we have dilators, right? So, we need dilators at many places in our body where you need to allow the fluid to flow. It could be blood, it could be urine, it could be lymph. So, this dilators will dilate a muscle as the name suggests. It will dilate a particular part, allow the movement to happen and immediately you will be having constrictors to stop the dilation. Correct? Then we have adductors. So, it is adductors and abductors. Now, these are common muscles, uh, the functioning of the muscles seen. Now, adductors are bringing anything closer to the body, to the midline of the body and moving away is abductors. So, there are many, many more, but these are the most important ones that we need to remember. Uh, the extensors, flexors, dilators, constrictors, adductors and abductors. Then in the movement of the muscles, as I said, the, uh, the initial force that is applied for a movement to happen, it is along with the, fun the uh, instruction given from the brain which reaches the muscle and then it is carried out. Now, this flow of action right from the brain to the different parts of the body will bring about the movement and there are, we have neuromuscular junctions, alright. Now, this neuromuscular junctions are the ones which brings about the initiation. There has to be a nerve impulse. Without the nerve impulse, you are not going to, the body does not react. So, everything that is, which is controlled by the brain will be following the exact command that the brain gives. And how will the brain give it? Through the neuromuscular junctions. Neuro, the nerve ending, the muscular part and they come in contact with each other and there is passing of information. Now, who carries that information is a person known as acetylcholine esterase. Acetylcholine esterase is the chemical which is actually going to excite the muscles to carry on the process further. Now, once the excitation part is done, remaining part is taken over by this people light bands and dark bands and they will carry the work further. Now, once this is this happens, the, the initial thrust or the force that initiates the process is called as the threshold, the threshold level which brings about the first chain of reactions. Now, along with the threshold level, we always 
have a very peculiar law working. Why peculiar? Because it is called all or none principle. Now, why all or none principle? This threshold level will initiate the reaction and either the muscles react or they don't react. It's simple. Now, if you have to understand this principle, I can just give, a, give the analogy of a gun maybe. I try to shoot with a gun and I pull on the trigger. Now, I am pulling on the trigger, definitely the bullet is going to go out. If I use multiple force and pull the trigger, is that going to affect the movement of the bullet? No. It is going to go with the distinct speed that it has got and it will hit in the particular way it has to. So, similarly, if the threshold level force that is applied, it will not change the reaction force, right? So, whatever force we are applying, that force is sufficient enough to bring about the movement. If you increase the threshold level force, that does not mean the effecting force is also going to be that much bigger. Music